After Delilah's death, I didn't need the big house we once wanted to fill with kids and pets. Even if I wanted to keep it, I didn't have the money to maintain it, not on my own. And so, I did what I thought was best, sold it to the highest bidder. That's what she would want me to do, too. That's what I told myself as I signed the papers, a smile curling on my lips. I was so sure that my wife was proud of me for moving on, so much, perhaps, that I didn't notice the signs that something was wrong first. It all started a week after I moved to my new house. One moment, I was sleeping soundly. The next, I bolted out of bed, wide awake despite having been sleeping only seconds ago. At first glance, everything was fine, but one of Delilah's beloved vases was lying on the floor, shattered. Huh, what happened to you? Did I maybe leave the window open or something? Maybe a stray cat came into play, or I don't know. Talking to myself was a nervous habit I'd developed mostly after my wife's passing. I felt a lot less lonely when I was talking to myself. After all, before her accident, both Delilah and I had worked from home, so we mostly hung out with each other. To be honest, I didn't have a lot of friends. She had some, but most of them lived quite far away. Basically, we saw each other 24-7, and we were content with that. But once I was on my own, things changed. I often had to shake my head a bit to snap out of my spiraling thoughts. I needed to focus on living and making my late wife happy. But, well, after that first incident with the vase, things seemed to get even stranger. Things disappeared. My wedding ring to start with. One second I was wearing it, the next I wasn't. I really thought I was going senile or perhaps not sleeping enough, but that wasn't the only thing to go missing. Pots, pans, even books seemed to just stop existing. I was starting to feel somewhat nervous, to be honest. Was my new cozy home haunted? That was the only <sighs> logical solution. After all, I wasn't going mad myself. Well, my therapist did say last time that I needed to take some vitamins to help with this awful brain fog I have. Maybe I am the ghost myself. But then, it happened. I had some co-workers over for once, though we were all working from my living room. Their office had no power, and we had some important projects to hand in. I was sitting on the couch with my laptop on my lap when it just started floating away from me. I, I had no idea what to say or do, though. I tried to reach for it. Slowly, the device inched away from me. Everyone was watching. Pat's jaw hung open. What the... And then, the laptop fell on the floor. It didn't shatter, which made me exclaim in joy. <sighs> Thank goodness. And then, it lifted into the air again, only to be dropped back onto the ground. The process repeated itself until the screen was shattered into tiny pieces. Dude, I think your place is haunted. Pat muttered after a moment. I swallowed hard. So, I wasn't the only one who felt that way. Go back home. That was when I heard her for the first time. The short hairs bristled on the back of my neck. The voice was so so familiar, but strange, too. Distorted to the point where I could barely recognize it. And yet... Delilah? Go back home, you fool! She hissed. She's always been a calm, patient soul, but suddenly she sounded so... so angry. I think I'm going mad. I muttered to my co-workers who were standing around, clearly too nervous to sit down after witnessing, well, whatever that was going on. Before, I really thought that moving was the right choice. I wanted a smaller place without many reminders of my wife, but, well, clearly she wanted none of that. The living room was a mess. The more I shook my head deciding not to obey her, the more the walls shook. Something really isn't right here. Eric muttered, he looked like he was about to beeline for the door, and 
Well, that's what he did only seconds later. I was alone within five minutes. Alone with Delilah once more. I needed to move. I couldn't afford our own place. I was rambling to myself by then, my hands ripping at my hair. I felt as if I was being dragged around by Delilah, or what was left of her. Let me just do my thing. Please, let me live a happy life. You don't deserve one, not after what you've done to me. I could feel her whisper into my ear. I swallowed hard as I tried to make a break for the door, but she wasn't letting me. The walls were trembling, the floor breaking apart at the seams. She wanted to trap me like I had trapped her. No! It wasn't my fault, and you know that! I yelled, though no answer came. I tried to head for the door like the others, but it was locked shut. No matter how hard I pulled on it, nothing happened. And then, everything went black for a second. When I came to, something was off. Sure, there were some things on the floor and my laptop was shattered, but there was no other sign of Delilah or even my co-workers ever being there. I was sitting on the couch perfectly fine, even though I should have been in pain. Maybe, maybe she was right. Perhaps it was time for me to move back home and face the truth of what I'd done. I smiled as I walked around the new house. We had just moved in, but it felt familiar because the house had been in my family for hundreds of years. Moving boxes were stacked everywhere, overflowing with packing paper. We had arrived, but we still had a lot of work to do to get everything unpacked. I looked over to my husband, who was in the kitchen crumpling packing paper. I heard my son laughing underneath a pile of boxes that my husband had just finished emptying. I walked out the wooden front door, standing on a concrete stoop, admiring the acres of empty land this old house sat on. All of this is ours, I thought. The sun was sinking past the horizon, and I could see storm clouds rolling in. I'm glad we got everything into the house before the storm hits. Taking a deep inhale, I could smell the rain getting closer. I shut the door and went back inside, finding my son and husband laughing on the floor in the middle of empty boxes. A burst of thunder shook the house. My husband smirked. These country storms don't mess around. Daddy, are we gonna be okay? We'll be just fine. We're all gonna camp out here in the living room for tonight. Okay? My husband reached over and pulled my son closer, putting his hand on top of mine. The lights flickered. My husband started blowing up the air mattress we had packed, knowing we wouldn't get enough unpacked to sleep in a bed tonight. I got up and walked to the top of the stairs. Each step squeaked underneath my feet. I saw a large cobweb in the window that was at the top of the stairs. Glancing out the window, it was pouring outside. I could see the grassy plains for miles and miles, the wind from the storm tossing the trees on our lot. Before I looked away from the window, I saw a man climbing over the fence that bordered our driveway. That's weird. My mom mentioned that the town is super welcoming, no matter how small it is. Maybe someone heard that we had moved in already. I skipped down the stairs, joining my husband and son in the furnitureless living room. The lights flickered again. The doorbell rang, echoing throughout the ancient wooden structure, like an organ playing at a funeral. When the sound finished, two abrupt knocks rattled the old wooden door. I answered it. A man, four inches shorter than myself, stood in front of me, soaked from head to toe. Joe, is that you? Hey, Marie, it's been, what, 20 years? I'm so sorry to bother you like this on your first night back in town, but my car broke down and I can't really make it anywhere by foot in this rain. That's awful. We don't have much to offer right now, but you're welcome to come inside until the rain stops. That's so kind. Thank you so, so much. I'll be out of your hair as soon as the storm breaks. Don't worry about it. It's nice to have an old friend around. I smiled as he walked into the house. 
I closed the door and saw him sit on the floor next to my husband and son. I grabbed a blanket out of a box and threw it to him. The lights flickered again. I have some spare clothes in the box upstairs if you want to grab some. It might be a little bit more comfy. Who knows how long this storm is going to last. It looks nasty. That would be amazing. It reminds me of the times when Marie and I would play in the rain after school. My husband guided him up the stairs, letting him into the upstairs room, then left him alone to change. I was at the bottom of the stairs when a loud bang of thunder rattled the house and the lights went out. I yelled through the darkness. I think there's a flashlight on the kitchen counter. I unpacked that box earlier. Don't worry, I'll go find it. I think there's a candle somewhere there too. Tripping over a box, he found the flashlight and flicked it on. The lights shone on a newspaper, highlighting the headline article. The headline read, Hiller escapes from local prison. He grabbed the paper and walked back to the living room where my son and I sat. Check this out. His voice wasn't as confident as it was when he said he knew where the flashlight was. It shook at the end of his sentence. I grabbed the newspaper, reading the front page. My eyes met his. My hands trembled. The picture for the article looked like a headshot of my childhood friend. We stared at each other without a word. Dad? Mom? What's wrong? Nothing, sweet pea. You stay here with the blanket. I'm going to go take a candle to our visitor so we can see. No, I'll go. You stay here. I got up. Candle in one hand, flashlight in the other. I approached the stairs. The flashlight illuminated only a small part of the ground in front of me. I felt a cold chill move down my back. I yelled up the stairs. Hey, are you still up there? I have a candle for you if you need it. There was no answer. I put my foot onto the first step, moving slowly. I flinched at the loud squeak of the third step. I slowly walked up the rest of the stairs. At the top, I saw something move and quickly turned around. The flashlight reflected in the window. My heart was pounding and my hand trembled. Hey, are you up here? It was silent. I felt a hand on my shoulder and I turned around. Hey, I brought this for you. Thanks. He pulled out a knife and held it at my neck. So, you know about me, huh? I swallowed. I looked out the window at the top of the stairs and saw a line of police officers racing toward our house. What? I don't know what you're talking about. I tried to act confused. Just what we shared with each other back in elementary school. I stuck out the candle, trying to keep him away from me. I backed up toward the stairs, distancing myself from him. Then he turned and ran down the dark hall, disappearing into another room. I sprinted back to the living room, setting the candle by my husband. The doorbell rang, and I opened the door. Two police officers stood at the door, water dripping from their uniforms. I felt relief surge through my body. You're under arrest! What? Why? There's been a warrant out for your arrest for a month now. Skipping towns doesn't change that. My husband rushed to the door, tripping over the candle on his way. The flames caught the blanket on fire. Dad, help! My husband went back and grabbed my son. The officers cuffed my wrists, walking me away from the house as flames started to eat the old wooden structure. Water dripped down our faces in the rain. The officers shoved me into the back seat of the car. I don't understand. The officers slammed the door of the car and started the engine. I looked out the back window of the car. My husband and son are standing in front of the burning house. We pulled away in the car, the rain blurring their figures as I looked behind. The house in flames. The police officer keeps driving. I scream, coughing tears. I don't understand. We rounded the turn of the driveway and they were gone. Sitting in my prison cell, I hear an officer. Copy that. Going to check out the fire over on Long Road. We have what we believe to be the remains of a nationally wanted serial killer from that fire. They say nothing is ever given, only earned. Years ago, my wife and I were met with an opportunity that completely rejected this idea. We were young then, far poorer too. 
We were desperate for a house, and the ones that we'd been looking round that were within our budget were run down and dangerous. We thought they were our only options. Until one day, we were met with the offer of a lifetime. Now, we remember it as the offer of two lives. Harry, are we sure this place is legit? There's no way this is the same price as some of the other shacks we've been looking around. Jessica, my wife, was extremely suspicious of the mansion we were currently being toured around. I mean, it's certainly bizarre that such a big place is worth so little. Maybe it's the area? I was trying to wrap my head around it too. We had been looking around houses that were practically falling apart up until now. So to suddenly be met with a house of this grandeur for the same price, it was unheard of. After some deliberation and another hour spent exploring the place, we had failed to find any faults with it. A week or so later, we bought it. Desperation transcended any worries or concerns we had with the unusual pricing-to-house ratio. The opportunity just seemed all too good to miss out on. Perhaps we had finally found ourselves a stroke of luck. Only, our luck was hollow. Our first day moving in, we were still plagued by awe at the white marble floors and beautifully painted walls. There was a golden chandelier hanging from the ceiling in the kitchen and the bedroom. It was the same size as my parents' entire upper floor. I can't believe it. It's... this is this really our home? <laughs> Jessica warbled, her eyes seeping crystallized tears. They were tears of joy. I paused for a moment. I thought I heard something like scratching coming from the wall. Shaking my head, I walked over to Jessica and hugged her tightly. I was crying slightly, too. This was far beyond just a welcome change in our miserable lives. Both of us worked office jobs, nine until five, every day, for minimum wage. At least now, we would be coming home each day to a magnificent place to sleep. And no parents whining, criticizing, shouting, and so on. Behind us, two men came in carrying our only piece of furniture, aside from the bed, that we owned. It was an old sofa, blackened with dust, fading with age. They set it down behind us before heading back out to grab the boxes with the rest of what little possessions we had were in. Releasing each other, Jess and I started pushing the sofa up against the wall. Suddenly, the sound of scratching came from within. It was the same noise as I had heard before, only louder. Probably the pipes? I spoke immediately, trying to block out any indication of a fault in the house. The price obviously meant something was wrong with it, but we dared not discover what it was, for our own sake. We gave each other an uneasy glance, but more boxes were coming in, so we walked away, trying to ignore the noise. The scratching was getting louder. We went to bed later that night, smiling, streams of tears dripping down our eyes as we rested in our new home. Life seemed so good. The scratching was getting louder. The next morning, we went down for breakfast and sat merrily, chomping away at our toast and butter, sipping away at the luscious cups of tea we made in our new kitchen. Scratching. Louder. Day after day, the routine progressed. The scratching became clawing, screaming, death amplified by sound. We caved. Something was making that noise. We called the estate agent the following morning, panic infused into our voices. Julia here, how can I help? She chirped, answering the phone. We spoke to her about the scratching noises coming from inside the walls, to which she gave the odd, hmm, and ah, okay, but never anything more. It was like she already had an answer, right from when she picked up the phone. Eventually, it became clear that she wasn't listening in the slightest. Jessica didn't react so well to that. What the hell is going on in our house? She screeched down the phone. There was a moment of silence. Julia breathed in, and suddenly, life had embedded itself into her as she began to speak. I'm sorry. 
I'm not so sure I can help you two. That house you're in, it, it's terrifying to me. The last estate agent who was allocated to it went missing the day he was due to tour around this guy. Recently divorced, I heard, when he never came back to the office. The police hunted for him, but both he and the set of house keys were gone. And there was no word back from the divorced man either. I don't want to be any more involved with that place any more than I already am. Goodbye. She slammed down the phone on the other end of the call. Both Jessica and I stood there, jaws open, staring at the phone in utter disbelief. We tried sleeping that night, but Julia's words had gotten to us, like an infection of sorts. The sound of the scratching had become unbearable, and there was this horrid stench reeking throughout the house, and all of it was strongest and loudest in the living room behind our sofa. We both sat up in bed, gave each other a look of determination, and darted downstairs, heading into the garage to grab a hammer. Now, we both stood in the living room, staring at the wall behind the sofa. I grasped the hammer in my right hand, and Jessica had her phone out in hers. The flash turned on. We flicked off the lights and saw that the paint on the wall right above the sofa was a different color to the paint around it. Our suspicions were right. We flicked on the light, and taking a deep gust of air, I began smashing down the wall. It fell apart with ease. It was poorly made, hollow. As I broke away at the drywall, the stench erupted. We covered our noses to avoid asphyxiation from the dreadful aroma. All of a sudden, as I broke apart more and more of the wall, a stampede of rats came sprinting out from the space behind it. They spread all over the floor, with blood trailing behind them. Our attention twisted back to inside the wall, and our eyes widened. Jessica instantly bolted away towards the bathroom, followed by the sound of vomit gushing from her mouth. I, however, remained still in the living room, paralyzed. I was staring into the empty eye sockets of a dead man, still suited up in the same style of outfit as our estate agent, Julia, had worn. There were keys lodged down his throat, his entire jugular displaced, still leaking with blood. The rest of his body was ripped apart, and the stench of rot filled the house with its grotesque essence. His skull had been caved in, too. Hours later, once the police had arrived, through the flood of tears and cries of horror, I overheard the police discussing that they had just found another corpse, bludgeoned to death. A pair of house keys belonging to this very house were found lodged down her throat. It didn't take a scientist to see the link. The other victim was identified to be the ex of the divorced man who had been touring round there just months before. The keys lodged down the estate agent's throat were keys to his old house, the same house his ex had still been living in. Perhaps it was a fit of rage a coping method, a desire for revenge. We moved out the following week. We had a feeling the man wasn't finished, 